Uh, question, has anyone not been healed in recent times when you prayed for them? If so, why? And why didn't John G. Lake heal everyone? The highest success rate John Lake had was 76%, right? Um, n- now, that's a general overview, and there were some diseases that he prayed for that he had 100%, but then there are others that were different, and a lot of this we'll get into as we go along. Now, it says, has anyone not been healed in recent times when you prayed for him? Okay, two things. Number one, I don't know of any. All right? I don't know of any that were not healed. Now, if I did, I would have to answer you in another way. Okay? Because what I say comes to pass. Do you understand? All right? Now, if the Bible says, and this is what we're going to get down to. Now, now listen, there is this, I was raised in a particular thought pattern, camp, what do you want to call it, that people would get prayed for, and then when they didn't, if nothing happened, then they had to stand in faith for their healing. Sometimes we met people that had been standing in faith for 20 years. Okay? That's really not Bible. I mean, really the closest example you have of that would be Abraham, and that was a totally different situation. Right? faith works and if you're in faith it works and now we've had to come up with a whole new terminology just so we don't violate what we believe and we say things like I believe I'm healed but now I'm waiting for the manifestation okay that's the same thing as saying you're not healed okay I mean I know what you're trying to do but honestly, you know, at some point we just have, to, and, it, and it got to the point in the group I was with that you couldn't even admit if you were sick because people would put you down because you made a wrong confession, right? Now, I don't, I don't go that way, right? Now, do I talk sickness and death and defeat? No. At the same time, I don't believe that you can lay hands on somebody and something not happen. Okay, now it the Bible says you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So, bottom line, that's it. When that is more real to you than what you're looking at, then what you believe will be seen in front of you. Do you understand that? So, in other words, this comes back to one of the main, you know, the, the chief things here is very simple. You've got to believe this more than you believe what you see. Now, when you believe this more than what you see, then what you're believing is the truth. And if you say the truth, you're not lying. You're only lying if you don't believe it. Okay? Because this is truth. So, now, I'm not trying to get in some weird, fancy little, you know, semantical gymnastics. Right? I don't believe in that. I believe... You lay hands on a sick, the power of God goes into them, they should be healed. Now, I can give you all kinds of other examples, and matter of fact, we don't have a lot of time, so I'll probably just give you some, some basic things here. Over and over again, the Bible, Jesus talked about it, talks about it in John, um, it talks about it in 1 John even, but it says that several times the word of God is referred to as a seed. When you got born again, you got born again of the incorruptible seed of the Word of God, right? Now, a lot of times we just run over that and say incorruptible seed, the Word of God. The fact that the seed of the Word of God is incorruptible means that once it's planted, it cannot fail to produce, right? Now, one verse over in Luke even says that no Word of God, you know, it says nothing shall be impossible to God. Well, literally what it says is no word of God shall be void of fulfillment. That's what literally the Greek says. So there is nothing in this word. This, this whole book is nothing but a book of seed. And if you plant the seed, it will grow. But the seed in the box doesn't do any good. Right? People say all the time, well, you know, I got all the faith in the world. Well, that's your problem. You need to let some of it loose. And it'll start working for you. As long as you keep it held back, it's not doing you any good. So, 
when you lay hands on a sick, on, on, on any sick person, or you speak to them, there's all kinds of ways to minister. You can minister through laying on of hands. That is usually the way the weakest, if you're very weak in power, that's the best way to minister. Okay? Because that's the most direct way where they get the most from you. The next, the higher level is to be able to speak. You speak a word and it happens, right? You speak healing to them. So you speak the seed. That's a higher level. Whatever works, works. Now in Mark 16, it says believers lay hands on the sick and they recover. People say, well, why would Jesus tell you to do the lowest form? Because the laying hands on the sick also signified to the sick person who you were doing it and in whose name you were doing it, and it was a sign. Mark 16 is for a sign, right? The problem in the church is we have turned healing from a sign to a reward. Healing is not a reward. So don't think of it in terms of, well, if I live right and do right and do enough good, God will heal me. No, you just moved away from God healing you because you're trying to establish it on your own righteousness rather than on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. All right? Now, we minister healing by grace. I don't deserve to be used by God, but I'm obedient to his word, which is what he says to do. You lay hands on the sick, and they'll recover. I'm obedient, and by grace, they get healed. Now, the person that gets healed is healed by grace. They don't deserve to be healed. Okay? But by grace, they get healed. So whether you need to be healed or whether you're ministering healing, it's going to be by grace. It's not going to be by your works. You can't fast enough, pray enough, do enough good works, tithe enough, or anything else. Do you understand? Two things we'll notice. And I don't know how we're doing money thing here because I don't, I don't keep up with that stuff. I don't know, okay? I know generally you do offerings and things like that, and that's how we do it in the States a lot. But the point is this. Saturday night when we do the healing service, regardless, and I say this, technically I can't override it, but I'm saying as far as I'm concerned, for the last, about the last four years during our healing services, which is usually our biggest crowds, we do not take up offerings, right? We do not take up offerings. Why? Because people have for so long tied money with healing. And they'll say, well, you need to sow for your healing. And if you'll sow for your healing, then God it. So we just stopped it. Right? You can't buy anything from God. All right? Now, amen. And so, and I've had people say, well, that's crazy. You shouldn't do it. That's when your biggest crowds are there. That's when you make the most money. No, it's because people come in and they're waiting for you to try to get their billfold out of their pocket. And when you tell them, you know what? You don't tonight's cover charge to get in here has been taken care of by Jesus. Amen. Amen? So you don't have to worry about it. Now, the other thing is too, if you send me a check or you write a check out or anything, whatever, I don't care what you do with somebody else, but if you send it to me, please don't put in the memo for healing. Right? I will tear the check up. Do you understand? Because I'm not going to be a part of you thinking you're sowing for healing. Right? Now, you cannot sow money for healing. Do you understand? The law of Genesis is every seed produces after its own kind. If you sow money, you're going to get money. Why? Because that's the seed you're sowing. Right? And you can't. Well, I'm naming my seed healing. You can't. You can call, you know, uh, you can call a, a, what is it, a Corsa? I'm trying to remember your cars here. You can call a Corsa a Renault if you want. Right? It's still going to be a Corsa. Right? Just because you call it something doesn't make it that. Right? If you sow money, you're sowing money. You can't name it different. It's not, it is named what it is. It's money. Right? So you're not sowing money. I mean, you're not sowing healing. It, matter of fact, if you want, the number one guaranteed way for you to get healed is for you to sow healing. How do you do that? Go pray for somebody. It's a guaranteed, it's the law. Right? Now, it's an earthly law. You say, well, how can, you know, how can you say that? Because I don't live by earthly law. See, if I live by earthly law, then I would be dependent upon you and what you sow as to what, how much money I get. But I'm not dependent on you. That's why I can tell you what the truth says and not what you want to hear. Because I don't care if you give or not. Right? Because you didn't bring me here. God brought me here. Amen? And he takes care of me. And, and whatever. See, I've learned I don't 
I used to live by sowing. I understand that's a natural law and it does work. But anybody can do it. Right? Anybody can do it. But children of the kingdom are to live by kingdom law. And kingdom law is not sowing and reaping. Kingdom law is everything he has is mine. Amen. Amen. Do you understand that? That's the difference. Now, do I give? Funny thing is, once I realize this, now my giving is over 40% as opposed to used to. It was working hard to keep it at 10%. Why? Because now I know I can't outgive him. Right? And, and if I give out, he pours back in. Now, I'll tell you, I'm not rich, and I, you know, it's funny because half the time we look at our budgets and we say, how did we do what we did last month? But we do it. And I go where I want to go. I eat what I want to eat, when I want to eat. If I choose not to eat, it's because I choose not to, not because I can't. You know, it's not, we're not on a forced fast or anything. You know what I mean? <laughs> Why? But it's because well, I've learned that God takes care of us. Amen. And he always does. Amen. Amen? Now, I don't have anything piled up. See, true prosperity is not how much you've gathered. True prosperity is how much you have access to. Amen. Well, I got access to whatever I need. All I got to do is let my Heavenly Father know. See, he said that you let him know. He didn't say tell everybody else. Right? So I wouldn't tell you my needs if I had any. Why? Because he says, let my needs be known unto him. Right? And when you do that, then whenever it's answered, you know it's God taking care of you and not because you put on a, you know, old poor me face. You know, and told everybody how hard it is to live by faith. Right? Faith ain't hard. Right? If you think living by faith is hard, try living without it. <laughs> Amen? That's when it gets hard. Okay? So, <clears throat> we, um, when you plant seed, it goes in. When you lay hands, you have to realize everything you do. For, for instance, you will not find in the Bible a healing ministry. Right? You won't find an evangelistic ministry. You won't find a deliverance ministry. You only find that in church. But you don't find it in the Bible. The Bible only really has one ministry. The ministry of reconciliation. That's it. So every person is a minister, every Christian, is a minister of reconciliation. So when I lay hands on a sick, see, if I, and, and the thing is we think sometimes, oh God, send down your healing power. Send down your delivering power. Send down your salvation power and say, no, he doesn't have healing power, salvation power, or deliverance power. What he has is life. And see, when you lay hands on a sick, then you're putting that life into their body. But when you put life into a body, what happens? They get healed. Right? So when you put the life of God into a person's body, you are reconciling their body. You know, you know what reconcile means, right? I mean, it means to, to make two people who are enemies at peace. That's one thing. But if you reconcile your checkbook, what does that mean? That means that you take your bank statement and you take your checkbook and you look and you say, okay, they say I spent this and here's what. So what are you doing? You're making sure they both say the same thing. Right? That's called reconciling it. So if we have the ministry of reconciliation, our job is for us to bring the life of God into a person's body so that their body says the same thing God says. Right? So now if I reconcile their body, if I put life into their body, I'm reconciling their body. But if I put the life of God into their soul, that's called deliverance. What am I doing? I'm making their soul say what the Bible has said. In other words, I'm making their soul, when I look at their soul because I put life in it, now their soul looks like what the Bible says their soul is supposed to look like, which is right. Okay? And whenever I put the life of God into a person's spirit, that's called salvation. But it's all life, right? See, we plug in an electric cord. Maybe it's to a heater. What do we get? Heat, right? I plug in my laptop. What do I get? Do I get heat? No. I get the power to work the laptop, right? Well, it's all electricity. But it has different manifestations. But the manifestation is based upon the need that I plug into it, not on the source. You understand? So the source, he says, if you have Jesus Christ, you have what? Life. He didn't say you have healing. He didn't say you have salvation. He didn't say you have deliverance. He says you have life. Now, when you have life in you, 
For instance, today we hear all kinds of, well, you know, Jesus came to give you abundant life. No, he didn't. That's a lie. He didn't come to give you abundant life. You understand? He said, I've come to give you life and that more abundantly. See, there's a different. See, drug dealers have abundant life. Abundant life is cars, houses, money. See, that's abundant life. But Jesus didn't give them, Jesus didn't come to give you abundant life. He came to give you life and that in abundance. See, a drug dealer can have an abundant life, but he can't have life in abundance. You understand? See, I've got life in abundance. You know what that means? That life in abundance is enough to keep me well, and I got so much of it. I can give it to you. That's life in abundance. Amen? And when I put life into your body, you get healed. And I put life into your soul, and you get delivered. And I put life into your spirit, and you get saved. Amen? So, in other words, quit trying to always grab for the gift or this thing or that thing, and just have life. And when you do that, everything gets easy, because then what everybody needs, you got it. Right? You don't have to send them down the street. Well, you know, that's not the gift I work in. No, you're to grow up to look like Jesus, and he helped everybody. Jesus didn't have to send anybody anywhere. Amen? So, you just give a life. Now, when you put your hands on somebody, and life goes into them. Now, the Bible says that a man can only give what he's received. I mean, now, you've given life. Matter of fact, over in Ephesians, let's, let's run over real quick. I'm trying to watch my time here so I can send you out. But I just want to touch this with you real quick. In Ephesians chapter 3, just see something that usually people... See, one of, the, one of the best, I shouldn't say best, one of the main sources of doctrinal error is reading half a verse. More doctrinal error has been birthed out of reading half a verse than probably any other one thing. Okay? Read the whole verse. If you're going to quote it, quote the whole thing, preferably. Okay? But in Ephesians 3.20, you know this, because it says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we think or you know, ask or think. How many times have you heard that? Oh, God can do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. And then we stop right there. That's not what that verse says. It says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So can God do exceedingly abundantly? Yeah, but he does it to us according to the power that works in us. Right? It's not that he just does it. He does it according to the power that's working in you. So you have, you have power in you, but that power has to be working in you. It has to be effectual. Now, he tells us that, that by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in us, in Christ Jesus, we make our, the communication of our faith effectual. Right? So that power that's in you, the way that your faith, that faith is that power, then the, the power that becomes effectual in you or working in you is by you acknowledging every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. So that's one of the problems I have when people live in the Old Testament or live in the, in the, even in the Gospels. Because that wasn't to you. Do you understand? John said, I wrote this so that you might know that Jesus is the Christ. That was the purpose of the Gospel of John. That's really the purpose of all the Gospels, technically. Now, is there anybody here that doesn't know that Jesus is the Christ? Okay, then the Gospels aren't really for you. The epistles are for you. Why? Because you have to realize, look, again, I'm going to have to send y'all, send y'all to lunch here. If you read, let's say you go into the gospel, you go to Matthew 8, or any in Mark, any of those, it's just healing after healing. Matthew 8, it's healing after healing, just constant. And you go there, and let's say you're sick. You got something going on in your body. And you read how, you go someplace, you read about how the one with the issue of blood said in herself, if I but touch a hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. And you think, okay. And see, that's been our problem, is we have taught people to get healed that way. And you go there. Now, if you're sick, you read that, you'll say, okay, I'm sick. Oh, okay. And you'll notice in every time it talks in any story about healing, you got usually three or four people. 
You've got the sick person. You've got the disciples. You've got Jesus. Usually you've got the Pharisees hanging around there somewhere too. Right? Now, when you read that account, you will almost always identify with one of those people. If you're sick, you'll usually identify with a sick person. Right? Now, if you're a little more advanced spiritually, you won't identify with a sick person, you'll identify maybe with the disciples. Now, hopefully you won't identify with the Pharisees. <laughs> okay? Now, which, you know, really the Pharisees got a pretty bad rap because, honestly, they were the most like modern charismatic Christians. They believed in a resurrection. They believed in spirits, demons, angels, that kind of stuff. They believed in the literal, you know, interpretation of the Bible. Well, they would have made good Pentecostal Christians, right? The problem was, is that they, they were so wrapped up in what they believed that they were willing to let people stay in bondage rather than violate what they believed. Well, again, like I said, that fits in good with most of the Pentecostals today. Right? It's amazing because a lot, we get invited to a lot of places, but a lot of times it's the hardcore Pentecostal. Oh, we don't need that. We know healing. Really, how many people are getting healed? Oh, well, we believe in it, but we ain't seen it. No, if you know it, it should be real to you. Well, so you identify with one of these people, but do you realize that if you read the Gospels, the only person in the Gospels that you have anything to relate to is Jesus. You understand that? Not the disciples. Okay, first off, not the sick person, even if you're sick. Why? Because they weren't born again. So that automatically separates them from you. The disciples weren't born again. Right? They weren't born again. So you can't identify with them. The Pharisees, well, that speaks for themselves. Okay? The only person in the Gospels that has what you have. Right? The only person in the Gospels that had the Spirit of God in them, like you do, is Jesus. So if you're going to read the Gospels, you can't read it from the viewpoint of the sick person. You can't read it from the viewpoint of the disciple. You have to read it from the viewpoint of Jesus. Because that's the only person that's like you. Now, one thing you're going to hear me say over and over again is, don't divide what God has joined. Because you will constantly refer to Jesus as separate from you. You understand? You're not separate from him. You are joined. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. Anytime you say, well, my faith, you just separated yourself. Your life is hidden in Christ. You understand? Your life is not separate. Well, my anointing, my gifting, my ministry. No, none of that's yours. We have the ministry of Jesus. It's the ministry of reconciliation. You understand? It, it's not yours. It's his gifts. You know what I mean? It's his spirit, his word, his name, everything. See, you do not, see, if I came here, I mean, think about this. If this was based on how much I pray, how much I fast, how, much, how many good works I do, then when I lay hands on the sick, I ought to be able to say, in the name of Curry Blake, you be healed. But I don't do that. Why? Because it's not in the name of Curry Blake, because it's not based on what good Curry Blake has done. It's based on what good Jesus has done. And so I say in the name of Jesus. So the good that comes out of it is the good he did, and it's based on his power, not my power. You understand? I, I don't even have authority. You don't even have authority. Isn't that right? I know you don't like that part, but it's true. So you have to either take it all or take it. See, the authority that you walk in is not yours. It's Jesus's. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore, you go in my name. Not in, not in your name. He hadn't given you authority. You got that name. That name has all authority. Well, you know, if I get stronger, then God can use me more. No, not really. Really what it comes down to is you need to be like John the Baptist. I must decrease so that he can increase. Amen? Now, don't get super spiritual and think decreasing means to put yourself down. And, oh, I'm nothing. No, no, that's not what it's talking about. The Bible says not to think more highly of yourself than you ought. Okay? But if you read, the, especially the epistles, you've got to think yourself pretty highly to think more highly than you ought. 
Because in Ephesians 1, 3, it says that God has said, well, the way the King James says, is that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. But in the original Greek, you know what that says? God has said every good thing about you he can say. You say, well, so, it's not, so see, God didn't bless you with blessings. Here's a blessing. Here's money. Here's a car. Here's, no, he has said every good thing about you he can say. And the good thing about that is when God says something, it happens. So when he says, by his stripes you were healed, guess what? <laughs> You're healed. Right? Well, then how come I don't feel good? Because the devil doesn't work with us. He works against us. See, if I take my finger and I squeeze it, and I squeeze real hard, or I get somebody else to squeeze it even harder, right? Now, what is the problem? Is the problem my finger? No, the problem is this, Right? Matter of fact, if I take this off, guess what? That finger is perfectly okay. Right? So if that's healed, and then this bad hand gets on it. Now, this finger is still healed. It's just got an attack by a bad hand. You understand? I mean, th this hand doesn't change anything about this finger. It is what it is. Right? But it doesn't feel like what it should feel like because it's doing something it shouldn't do, right? So my job basically is to get the hand off of it. When I get the hand off of it, then the healed finger gets to realize the fact that it's healed, right? So by his stripes, you were healed. Now, you say, well, then how come I don't feel healed? Because you have a bad hand holding on to you, and it's our job to just knock that thing off of you. Once we get that off of you, there you go. You're free. Amen? Isn't that simple? That's easy stuff, right?